Dim Lights and Stiff Drinks, the dive bars of Seattle, is proud to be sponsored by the Stedman Group. The Stedman Group is a local independent business that owns and operates Targi's Tavern, profiled here in Season 1, Episode 9, The Pogi, Season 2, Episode 12, The Duval Tavern in Duval, and Larry's Tavern in West Seattle. All of us here at the podcast are pretty tough critics when it comes to how the local dive bars are being run, and we have always been extremely impressed with all the dive bars owned by the Stedmans. This is because all drinking establishments, especially those that have been around for a while, each have their own unique character and charm, and it's obvious when you walk into a Stedman's bar that you are devoted to maintaining that tradition. And for that, we raise our glasses and cheers. The Stedman Group, committed to preserving the legacy of dive bars throughout the Puget Sound region. Welcome to the big show. This is Dim Lights and Stiff Drinks, the dive bars of Seattle. We are a podcast that visits local dive bars, historic taverns, and old drinking establishments. We are setting out to document those bars that have a seedy backstory and interesting history behind them. But best of all, we are actually recording these episodes live at the bar itself. For this episode, we are at the Eastlake Zoo. This is actually a return visit for some of us. As you may remember, we actually uh, recorded an episode here back in season one. Back yes, in we the got Dizze. to take a peek at the chest of all the old flyers and memorabilia that they had going yeah. back 50 no, years. No jump in ahead. Yeah. No, look back. No spoiler alert. Well, speaking of looking back, uh, the reason we're here tonight is the zoo is celebrating their 50th anniversary this week, and they invited us back here to help them celebrate. And so we're back for this very special nice. episode. 50 is uh, diamond, right? Isn't 50 diamond? The diamond anniversary? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah I think you're right. I think you're diamond. right. Diamond. The diamond. Yeah. So you're going to buy them a diamond? Uh, sure. Yeah. Well, well, no, they, they buy us a diamond. Is that what it is? Yeah, that's okay. how it works. Okay, yeah. okay. You glue it on a snooker table. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, so we're here for the Big 5-0. Uh, joining me, as always, is our producer extraordinaire, Bob Trombley. How you doing, Bob? Bob. Uh, and, of course, my two co-hosts, Lou Dog and Jeremy. How are you guys doing? Fantastic. Happy to be back. Yep. Mm-hmm. And I think I got to go with uh, I gotta go with MC Diamond. MC Diamond. Hell you, yeah. You kind of have to at this point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. We also have a very special guest tonight. Joining us is local best-selling novelist Thomas Constam, uh, of course, author of Lake City, as many of you have probably read, as well as an upcoming book that we'll talk more about. Welcome to the show, Thomas. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. It's yeah. good to be here. It's a little intimidating sitting at this table. Two noted authors, <laughs> right? I mean, it's getting crazy around here. Shadows of giants, yeah. huh? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, and Thomas, you, know, you, ble- you, you betcha on the show. Peter Blecka, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he's been on too. I'm going to try to get him back on. Yeah, and as far as Thomas and I, so Thomas, I realized that, uh, I was thinking about it today, I realized that we've known each other for five years now. Yeah. Uh, our Didn't writing your guys' cups, books kind of come out at the same time? The same year, yeah. yeah. So uh, 2019, Lake City came out in early 2019, and my book, uh, Seattle Prohibition, was due to come out later that year. But did, did we meet through the books, or did we meet a different way? I forget. I don't remember, but the books is what drew us together, because I remember I was a little freaked out, because I didn't know what to expect. Mm. Like, one, once my book was released, how to, you know, to do all the promotion, and yeah. what, how that was all going to play out. So I think I was asking you, t- trying to pick your brain, and you and I met for coffee on Lake City in your hood. And you kind of went over the whole drill with me. It was like super, super helpful. Uh, And we've been friends ever since. This is true. Um, I remember that you said, I I come from a a punk background and like where everybody helped each other out and just, you know, try to make things happen. I was like, I like this guy. I think, uh, yeah, I think we need to talk more. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and we've been good friends ever I'm since. I'm fantasizing that you, you two met in like a super secret author's speakeasy. No, it was a coffee shop, and it was on Lake City, and I remember going in. and sure, uh, coffee shop. It was shop. super cool because there were posters for Lake City plastered all over the walls. They were on, like, your neighborhood was obviously psyched about the book. And I remember seeing I, that. I hope that, I, I, I don't, yeah, maybe, maybe it was at, um, at the Coffee aquarium. Clutch. Coffee Clutch. That, I think so. Yeah, that sounds the right. Place there. You might then, be right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Right on Lake so. City Way. Anyway, glad you're on the show with us. And, Thank and you welcome. so much. Thanks for having me. 
Now, as I mentioned, uh, we recorded an episode here before in which we covered the history of the place. Uh, so we're season gonna, two. Season uh, season one, actually. Season one. Season that's one. What's I that? think, uh, season one, episode, episode eight. Something or other. I, I looked at it today. Yeah. That's why it's fresh in my right. Otherwise, I would not remember it all. But tonight, you know, they invited us to come here and celebrate their, their big 5-0. So that's why we're here tonight. Yeah, yeah. So what what year did they open? It was 74 then? 70, 74 four. is when the zoo right. became. Now, it was a tavern before that. So I guess you guys want to just kind of go over the brief history just to... Yeah, yeah let's do it. This, this, place is, this place has an awesome history. This has an, and you have yeah. some extra you stuff us, you're going to throw yeah, in. Yeah, take, so. take us back to okay. down memory lane there, Brad. So a trip down memory lane. So Houseboat hippies. Well, so this place first opened as a tavern in 1934, right after Prohibition was repealed. It was originally Joe's Place. Uh, and then it went through a series of name changes and different owners over the ensuing years before it became the zoo. And Jeremy, it sounds like you got some info on some of those places. Well, yeah, like you said, it, it's been a ton of different drinking establishments prior to the zoo. So it's, 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 it's awesome to have a 50-year history of the zoo, but it goes back way earlier than that as a drinking establishment. So a lot of places we go to, it's like, yeah, they were a drinking establishment before that. It was like a, a hardware store or a brothel or, you know, something like that, right? Yeah. But no, this place has been a drinking place, right? A working man's drinking pub yeah. for a long-ass time. And it's got a long slew uh, you know, the history of different owners and different uh, establishments is pretty cool. Like you said, back in uh, 1935, there's a register of, like, some unknown pub. Like, we don't know the name of it, but it was definitely a drinking establishment, right? And yeah. then, like you said, um, uh, Joe's Place back in 35, uh, Tommy Woods Tavern in 41, Teal and Moffat's Tavern in 45, Jen Jack's Tavern in 44, Max Tavern, uh, named after Ivan Mac McKinnon in 1948. Hank's Tavern. Damn. <laughs> in 1960. <laughs> 1965, the It'll Do Tavern, which that's pretty that's cool. A good name. That's, yeah, that's a good name. Do. That's a good name. And then, uh, you know, 1974, got purchased by the co op, and, you know, the whole history we know and love. But just the fact that it's been so many different drinking establishments. Even prior that's to 1974, list. yeah, that is that's a long pretty. List. That's very impressive. Yeah. Very impressive. And they all sound like very blue collar places, right? Totally. Like you can just yeah. imagine Joe's the place. Yeah, Come yeah. on. Come yeah. On. Yeah. Exactly. I'd like to go to Tom Cruise. Yeah. Totally. Uh, yeah, and then of course in 74, 50 years ago, a group of people who lived in a hippie houseboat community on nearby Lake Union banded together, purchased the tavern, and thus the East Lake Zoo Tavern was born. Uh, in true hippie fashion, it was uh, formed as a worker co-op. Amazing. Yeah, like yeah. PCC, but a tavern <laughs> version of like PCC or REI or something. Yeah. Do you know some of the original names of that co-op even before it was the zoo? <laughs> Hanks. No, actually, no. Did it start out as the zoo? No. No. Well, okay. it was purchased by, like you said, kind of the co-op. Even before they named it the Zoo Tavern, there was the Intergalactic Tavern Co-op. <laughs> oh, right. Amazing. Right? That pretty much says How it all. fucking yeah. 70s is that? How right? much acid was involved yeah. in that? Totally yeah. 70s. Yeah. And then, you know, like you mentioned in the previous episode, the Ooze Brothers, right? Zoo spelled backwards, Ooze Brothers. Ooze Brothers, that's, okay. that's pretty good. That's pretty okay. good. And, right. and then, you know, some more drinking and drugs were involved, and they came up with East Lake Zoo. Okay. That's amazing. Yeah. After it went through so many hands of people that couldn't get their business straight, a collective of hippies they did it. it together. The yeah. Intergalactic Tavern Co. Yeah, according to local tavern lore, uh, the original owners wanted to open as a co-op, so they, basically so they could make enough money to drink for free. I think the original Solid idea, strategy. Did, yeah, they awesome. would take turns bartending and tending the bar, you know, and working here in exchange for free beer. So, I feel like I feel like East Lake is a really different type of neighborhood too. It's a sort of like thin strip neighborhood that runs alongside the freeway and kind of transitory. Yeah, it's like, like an enclave. Of yeah, like you either live here, the, there are people passing through, it's just um, a lot of, I don't know, just different types of establishments here than you'd find elsewhere in the city. Um, yeah. That's and, a really and, good yeah. point too, and, and I came in off of I-5, the Roanoke exit that kind of dumps you right into the heart of East Lake, right where we are now. But I don't think that exit was there off of I-5, like, the whole time. Yeah, it's a that, relatively, relatively new. new yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so back when, point. you know, the zoo was 
first founding, you were kind of like out in the boonies because there was not uh, you know, that close of an I-5 I-5 wasn't there yet. Yeah. Well, well, in those early years, I-5 Gave hadn't been built beach. yet. Once I-5 was built, that probably really changed it, and that kind of sectioned yeah, it off as right. this little, like, landing strip, basically. You probably pissed off a lot, a lot of neighbors. Of yeah, yeah, well, they oh, just yeah. plowed over people's houses. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, and you can it's, still it's, look it's, around it's, it's, and see some places that are kind of tucked underneath the freeway, and yeah, it's they, they, a, they probably weren't too happy. It's a unique neighborhood, by you know, in a city with a bunch of unique neighborhoods. But this is a, this is a, it's a, it's a different one. Now, it was interesting as far as the co-op goes. Like traditional co-ops, all East Lake Zoo employees have a say in how the business is run. It includes everything from new hires drink prices and even if troublesome customers uh, should be 86 or not. It also means that if the zoo is ever sold then each of the hundred odd people who have worked here over the past decades will receive some money based on like how long they worked here and things like that. It's nice. great. So it's, 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 it's like a, a stonecutter's cool lodge. Yeah. It's a true co-op. Yeah. It's a true co-op. 100%. Yeah, since becoming the East Lake Zoo the bar has expanded in size to be, include the famous game room right below us. What did you call it the last time? Uh, Chuck E. Cheese for adults? Yeah, it's been described as Chuck E. Cheese for adults, and that's a good description. It's stocked with pool tables, ski ball, and a big old, big old shuffleboard snooker table. and a snooker table. That could be wrong, but I think they actually added a second pool table since we were here last time. It's possible. I don't remember if they had uh, one or two. That's, they put up the ping pong they table. Have a, they have a snooker table, too. Yeah, uh, they have they, a snooker table. Oh, I mean, it's, this has always been like well. a serious pool bar, even, the, even though... Yeah. They've always had the snooker, yeah. and they've always had at least one pool, but did yeah. they have two pool tables? I'm not saying you're wrong. You might that's be nice. right. But. People bring their own sticks when you come to play here. Yeah. 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 Come correct. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, you, when we recorded, you go down there, you're going to lose some money. <laughs> we got the story of the snooker table refurbishment. So, my it's right. twenty thousand okay. dollars to get a guy from Australia to come refurbish here to do a special the guest. snooker table because there's only a couple people in the Not world people know it. Yeah. that can do it. I think one one of you mofo's should write a Don't snooker put your beer on table it. history book because I'm sure it's fascinating. I feel like a Brit or a, should write that book. Maybe <laughs> like it's uh, you know. More of a more of an eight ball country. Do you fake um, it a little non de plume or something? Yeah, yeah. perhaps, perhaps. <laughs> but so my, my my one zoo pool story is that my my dad used to come here and shoot pool and he said that uh, Charlie Royer, so who was the mayor of Seattle from the late seventies until nineteen ninety, I believe, seventy eight to ninety, something like that. He was a regular I don't know a regular, but he was frequently seen here shooting pool. And um, that was a different Seattle, different time when you could come out and just hang out with the mayor, have right. a beer, and, yeah. and uh, shoot around a pool. But yeah, <laughs> shout out to Charlie Royer. Yeah, he yeah. went on to being some Harvard guy, and like he was, he was, yeah, he was an iconic mayor as as Seattle mayors go. Um, end of end of uh, yeah, we haven't had probably have we had anybody as sort of long term as him since? Was no, he? they've all been like yeah, one or two terms. Quick hook, yeah. Yeah, quick hook. He, yeah. I guess we'll see how Bruce Harrell uh, yeah. will end up doing. Harrell seems like he might stick yeah. around for a minute. We'll yeah. see. And then after him was Norm Rice. Norm Rice, Norm was, Rice uh, was, he was I, I'll say Norm Rice was iconic too. He was okay. iconic. Yeah. I would agree. I'll say Rice was yeah. But uh, ch- anyways, Charlie Royer supposedly hung out here with some frequency and okay. shot pool so something to be said for that and uh, as did ed cone sam my uh, my late great father so yeah yeah once upon a time uh, super cool uh, yeah yeah and speaking of the snooker table after right after we recorded our episode here iron maiden came into town and I guess they were spotted here playing snooker. Because I guess they were obvious. snooker players. Brits. Get out of here. Brits, yeah. right? So oh, Brits, only, yeah. If only yeah. we were a week later. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. And it's perfect because no one would really give a shit. If, like, <laughs> they went downtown, people would go, oh, my God, it's Iron Maiden. But here, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, might, you, you might not even notice. Yeah. Four more old houseboat hippies just showed up off the boat. I would probably fanboy if I was here in Maiden World. Oh, my God. You know? Yeah. I think I'd have to. Yeah. But uh, we look up, are there any snooker tables in town? Oh, East Lake Zoo. Take us there. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Are they in town tonight? Because that would be amazing. The Stones are in town. Stones. Yeah. yeah. They, like they might come in. Yeah. yeah, they might come in. 
Yeah, I mean, how, pretty sure. Like, imagine Keith Richards walks in, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 He yeah. might not be recognized in this neighborhood. You, you never know. You never Cash know. only. Never know. Yeah. yeah, get out. <laughs> if he were going to go somewhere, this wouldn't be a bad fit for him. So. Yeah. I can see Hell it. Hell yeah. I can see it. Well, anyway, so with all that history, uh, what do you say? Do you, what, you guys want to do uh, what you're drinking? Yeah, Jeremy, you've got a flight. Yeah, you got a quite flight. a game. Over your flight. Oh my God! Yeah, well, what you you know, it is 50th anniversary at the Zoo Tavern. What you drinking? It takes on a whole new level uh, tonight, and it's gonna get fucking epic, right? Because oh, they way up their tap game. Yeah, and uh, it, unbeknownst to all of us coming into this, they didn't even announce this beforehand. The flyers, all of the you know, come to the 50th anniversary, whatever. Complete custom brewed tap selection from a variety of different local microbreweries in town just for the 50th anniversary. So it's like, oh my God, right? So like right in front of me is a flight, which I think this might be the first time we've had a, like a flight at a dive bar. That is bar. the first on the, sh- on the pod. Right? First first flight on the pod. It'll so come up as a trivia question for our listeners. That's pretty cool. Pretty cool. Beer flights, very popular in the Pacific Northwest, but not not super popular in dive bars, right? Talking to the bartender, brought in these little cool little wooden flight handles specifically for the 50th anniversary, just because he knew people would be like, oh, hey, look at all these awesome beers. Like, well, give me a sample of blah, 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 blah. And sure enough, got a flight. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six custom beers on tap just for the 50th anniversary, right? Is this one of them? Uh, the, yes, we're all drinking like 50th anniversary special yeah, beers. Yeah, every beer on the tap was made by the guy that's running the bar right now. He yeah, I heard it earlier. Really, I just don't yeah. believe it. Yeah. Yeah, no. It's amazing. It, it is yeah. amazing. We've got a Maritime Pacific. It's got a special 50th anniversary East Lake Dilsner. <laughs> We've got uh, Georgetown. Yeah. Good old Georgetown did Zoo Brew 79 for... 74. Uh, 74. Uh, special um, brew uh, IPA just for the 50th anniversary. Elysian stepped up their game. Did at least an East Lake Hazy IPA just for the 50th anniversary. We've got an ITC did a, a Pilsner. A Stemma did another Hazy IPA specifically for the 50th anniversary. And Howard's little, tiny little micro we don't see on tap. Like, I don't think we've ever seen Howard's. I don't think we've ever seen well, Howard's on tap here. Howard's, Howard is his dad. He's yeah. the guy that owns the zoo, so he made that one. Yep. And that's what I'm drinking. It's very good. It's good, fantastic. Ha- yeah. Hail Lels. Yeah. <laughs> Hail's Lager. It's fantastic. But yeah, I mean, you're not going to see this on tap anywhere else. Right. For sure. So wow. That's, that's fantastic. And then there's and, and there's another like six or seven uh, taps uh, around the corner, but we don't even bother talking about those because they're yeah. definitely overshadowed by the 50th anniversary special brews. Fantastic. So, yeah. Like I said, I got a flight. I'm doing a combination of the ITC uh, Pilsner. I did um, the Georgetown Zubru 74 Hazy, the Stemma uh, Hazy IPA, um, and I got a little taster of the Howard's Hells Hell Hells, all of which fantastic. Very good. I cannot decide on a favorite. I'm still working on it. Yeah. What's the one I'm drinking then? I'm thinking you had. I'm it's thinking the Oregon Ducks colored one, orange and green. Ducks colored one. That might have been the Stemma. That might be the Stemma IPA. It's amazing. Which was very yeah. good. That's yeah, really cool. Very very good. And it, you got the hell, the Hells, the uh, Howard Hells. Howard Hells. Fantastic. Yeah. Big thumbs up. Really great stuff. Yep. It was just fact It's that almost like, like an intense six. steam beer kind of lager. Yeah, that's a good description, actually. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. like lightweight with a really kind of bittery kind of IPA Session-y taste. Cool. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. yeah, for sure. Yeah. Huh. So, Jeremy, Stop you're in super. heaven. I know it's oh a bit of a yeah, super from you, stoked. but uh, you should be here every night until these kegs are gone. Well, you ain't coming back. For right? sure. That's right. That's right. And, and uh, you know, the bartender was talking about how you, know, take, you got some planning, right? These are, you know, months in advance to get these brews made from all, you know, and have six breweries step up to the plate and do a 50th anniversary special beer for this event. Pretty awesome. Yeah. 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 Pretty awesome. And they've all got unique tap handles just for these 50th anniversary beers. So not only did they brew killer beers just for this event, they even stepped up and got the cool tap handles customized with the Zoo 50th anniversary. All of them are awesome. We'll put some pictures up on the on the socials. Thomas, what about you? What were you uh, drinking? 
Uh, it's a Fremont Pilsner. Okay. It's uh, easy drinking, yet uh, with some good flavor to it. Not uh, a little click up from a, from a lager. Okay. Um, yeah. Are you a like, fan? I don't know if you're a big beer drinker or not. Well, for better or for worse, I am a beer drinker. Yeah. Oh, you, what, what, <laughs> oh, it's for better. Yeah, it's for better. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've been trying to tone it down here and there, but yeah, no, I uh, I, I enjoy uh, beers quite a bit. So. so, what's your go-to? Like, what what's are you an so, IPA guy or what? Are, no, I'm not an IPA guy. Actually, I'm I'm. We won't a lager it drinker. You. Yeah. No, I mean everybody's. That, come on, everybody's an IPA guy at this point. Pretty much. So, yeah, yeah. I'm it's almost to, become a stereotype. I'm trying to rock the boat. I, I, I had a, a moment in my life a few years back where a friend of mine was like, there's nothing wrong with a Coors Light, you know? Just fucking drink a Coors Light. It's easy drinking. And I had a Coors Light, and I was like, it's pretty fucking great. And uh, I feel like I could just move on with my day after that. I'll drink a Rainier. I'm a Modelo Especial, Sapporo drinker. Okay. Um, my wife's Brazilian. Brazi- in, in Brazil, they basically just drink... Like cheap watery beers throughout the day, yeah, kind of, yeah. it's kind of like coffee in Seattle. It's what you do at lunch and move on from there. And it's not really drinking; it's like just it. something yeah. you're doing in the background, like breathing or you know. And it's low enough alcohol where you're not destroyed for the rest of the yeah, day. Yeah, it's like three, four yeah. percent. And so, yeah. so I have, um, you know, I I enjoy a hazy pale ale here and there. I, I don't like things that are super hoppy, but yeah. I enjoy a porter here and there, but generally speaking, the I'm, a, I'm a lager pilsner drinker. As a I, I like I like stuff that's not going to knock me super sideways. Um, yeah. Until I have enough of them. So. <laughs> <laughs> it does catch up with you after a while regardless, but, um, yeah. you yeah. know, you know. There's well, no, there's, there's no shame in a high life. There's, you know, it's a, not at all. I'm, I'm not like trash all. at heart, 100%. man. I can't, you know, I, right. I, I'll own that shit. So. Yeah. And the and Zoo got Tavern to, has got you covered. I mean, they, they've, they've got a yeah. great selection of, of, like you said, some lighter stuff. We got yeah. that Coors Light listed, uh, you know, on I saw tap. A Montucky cold snack up there. They got the tall. I, 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 I'm a fan of. They got some good uh, bottles. They got Rainier bottles. They got Tall Boys tall also. Boys. They, yeah. And they have a great selection on draft. I. I did go with the Pilsner uh, on draft, but uh, yeah. it's all good. It's yeah, all good. This it's all is, this, and is the, this is the place to be. This this yeah, this is a place to have uh, a high life. Seems to like in the, in the classic bottle seems to fit well with the ambiance. I mean, you know, I would agree, does, except yeah. that they have such an epic tap list on draft that, like, I, I just I got to go. go way. You can go, go either way here. That's I, I, I mean, that's what you're getting at. That yep. you can go if you want to go super diet. And you know this is this is a dive bar, but it's not a traditional dive bar because it's got more going on than just drinking, right? It's got all these different activities. It's got all this, you know, different kind of history. Yeah, it's got, snooker. Yeah. It's got, it's got snooker. snooker. It's got it's an <laughs> elevated, uh, not, not you know, and organically so. It's not like somebody yeah. set out to oh, we're going to make an elevated dive bar, but you know you can you can drink a, you can drink a high life or you could drink something uh, more crafty here if you want you can drink so it you can you can drink a beer that you're never going to have again if you're not here in the next couple Damn weeks straight. and I will That's argue right. again that it's in an interesting part of town and holds a unique spot in an interesting part of town there are no other it's not like there are a row of similar places to this around here this is yeah. you know there's couple of fancier restaurants down the street basically and that's really it I there mean, there's are a, there's yeah. some good and there's, in the other side of the street there's some good like divey restaurants mm-hmm. and uh, some either uh, and some uh, good uh, drinking establishments down the road too yeah yeah why am i blanking what's the italian restaurant a serafino my wife my wife's like, a chef and down. she worked at serafina for about a decade and oh, so that's wow. actually oh. i Whenever we're going to talk about this, but but uh, my main connection with the zoo is that she used to work there when we first met, and um, had a real family atmosphere there. So and they have a bar, but it's <laughs> primarily a cocktail bar. So you hang out, have a couple of cocktails there after after service. I would go meet her and you know hang out, and then um, yeah, and then when you. I think everybody got one free cocktail there or like, you know, for, for all the employees. 
And then you move on to expensive cocktails from there. It was time to move down to the zoo eventually. And, uh, <laughs> so there $24? Were, yeah, oh, okay. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So this is pre, pre-$24 cocktails, but they were still, you know, $11 cocktails. Which in was two, a lot back then. 2006 or whatever. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it was a very family atmosphere there. It was a really cool spot that um, the, woman, the woman that owned it, um, she had... She'd started off like selling hot dogs in, in Alaska or something and then <laughs> made a bunch of, yeah, I guess you can sell a hot dog huh. for like 10 bucks in Alaska <laughs> in, the, in the 90s even. And the, opened this restaurant and had this very family atmosphere. People that worked there for decades, all the people, you know. So it was, it was, it was really cool just to even see that, uh, tan, you know, from, from the side, I guess, as a... Uh, the significant other of somebody who worked there, but uh, the zoo was definitely in the orbit, and this was where you would where you would move to as the evening went on. Uh, yeah, well, you like, mentioned that Serafina had a bar, so I think maybe we could do an episode there. I'm getting a little hungry. <laughs> yeah, it's more like doing yeah, shout out to Serafina. Yeah, they would they would take some umbrage to be called divey. It's a, they're, they're, you know, okay. They're, they're, yeah. Right, you know. How many uh, Us birthdays up their or anniversaries? I just want some dinner, man. Yeah, they have, it's Serafina, right? They have new ownership, so One I can't me, speak to at it. Least. Yeah. 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 Jeremy? All right, maybe next season. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, anyway, so what do you say? Should we take a break for round two? Yeah, let's oh, get yeah. There's, I, there's, a, there's still at least five or six other beers we have to try. <laughs> I'm going to get a fight, too. I okay, like yeah. I like this job. You guys got it figured out. Damn right? straight. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, Satan's Pilgrims, take us out. We'll be right back. All right. We're back. And... Uh, you know, we're kind of like playing this show kind of freeform jazz style tonight. We didn't really come in here with a script because we didn't really know what to expect. Do we ever have a script? We never have a script. Shh, you're not supposed to tell okay, them that. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, we got Thomas Constam here with us tonight. Hello. And uh, he has a new book coming out. He gave me uh, an advanced copy of it. And I was fortunate enough to, I've read half of it so far. I'm pretty, like, I was talking to him before the show. I'm pretty blown away by it. I'm, like, really, really, really enjoying it so far. I, I really appreciate your kind words. I feel a little little modest about, like, yeah, you should I look at the floor when you're, yeah. No, yeah. I, re- I really appreciate that. And, and it's a big book. It's a big book, too. It it's, is. It's, like, it is. probably going to be, like, four pages. Yeah. Um, we'll see when it's actually printed out, but it's probably going to be in, like, the 400 plus range. 400 range, we'll say, you know? Yeah. So it's not a... Right. So I appreciate you, history, Brad. Right. It's not like, hey, read my book, you know? It's an e- easy thing. It's a, it's a rather significant undertaking. But that's that's what I did during COVID was uh, yeah. type my yeah, ass off. That so. was your COVID project? That was my COVID project. Yeah. Yes, so. What's the name of the book? It's called Supersonic. Is it about uh, the Seattle Supersonics? Well, it they, is. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I, you, what I, I've read so far, they kind of they kind of fit in a little bit. They nice. they they play a minor role, but it, it the central metaphor of the book is much more about the Boeing Supersonic. Yeah. yeah. And there's Jet a guy City. Larry who's a, a machinist. So so let me let me take it one step back. It, it's covers four families um, over the course of roughly 150 years of Seattle history, 1860s, 1890s, um, 1950s, 1970s, and 2010s. And I, I set out to essentially write the great Seattle novel. It's, it's all a fictional neighborhood, but I really wanted to get kind of at the spirit of uh, what makes this city what it is. Yep. And uh, one of the primary characters is guy Larry you know, dishonorable discharge from the from the Navy in the in the late sixties. He does manage to find his way into a machinist job at Boeing. He's working on the supersonic. And the supersonic was supposed to change the world. It was gonna completely redefine the human relationship with time and space and we were going to be like their version of the concord or something yeah exactly it was it was to beat the concord it was going to be the american concord and we were going to you know 
people were going to go to to Tokyo for lunch, basically. You know, you're going to go three hours, <laughs> nice. turn around and come back. Oh and, my God, I don't and, know this uh, story. So, yeah, no. So the Supersonic was, well, you'll know the aftermath because the, the story was is that it was going to, and we're coming off of World War II where American technology was just going to change the world. The history was behind us and everything was just going to continue to move forward, move forward, move forward, move forward. And in 1971, the Supersonic got canceled. All the funding got cut off from the government, and it cratered the uh, the economy of Seattle for a generation. Basically, we've heard about last you yeah, know yeah. last people out of Seattle turn out the lights yeah, or whatever. Yeah. That, yep. that yeah. was all the immediate aftermath of the Supersonic getting canceled. So essentially, the metaphor is, is we went from this is going to change the world to. Not only did it never fly a single flight, it was never even built. They built a uh, balsa wood model. That's all that exists. <laughs> oh. Like, like Howard mean, Hughes. It was a, yeah, it was a massive government boondoggle. But yeah, it's you know essentially reaching from this for the stars, falling on your face, um, but then getting up and you know in many ways the effort for the supersonic wall it didn't pan out in that way. It planted some of the seeds for the birth of the later technology industry in Seattle and the whole engineering culture that, that gave birth to the Microsofts and the Amazons. Um, so so I, I, I just see that as a very, you know, Seattle's a place of, I hate to say innovation, sound like I'm writing something well, no, for you Microsoft. Can say it. But, Everyone knows but, everything yeah. comes from Seattle. Well, yeah, everything, yeah. 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 The computer, you yeah. order stuff online. do things Seattle. in a different way of trying to, like, reach for the stars and reinvent life and fucking up and being you know it's a boom bust place where yep. you know things are going great it's it's so, so in the background well let me finish that point it's just that you know reaching for the stars falling short and then you know maybe not getting what you want but getting what you need in the long run and that's um, that that's what I see as kind of a central character wait, in wait, Seattle. Wait, wait. Did you just drop a Stones reference? <laughs> <laughs> the day not after a, the Stones. The day after the Stones were here topical. in Seattle. Could have, been, uh, could have been in my subconscious. If you did, mind. if you did it subconsciously, that's impressive. Well, Seattle yeah. will give you what you need. Yeah, yeah. yeah. give you what you need. And, yeah. and uh, in the background of all of it, so you know, I told you that you know, 1860s, 1890s. 1950s, 1970s, 2010s. In, in the background of all that is very much the boom-bust cycle that's created in the city, whether it's the Yukon Gold Rush, um, you know, the peak of aerospace post-World War II, the, the supersonic Down. falling on its place, or then in the 2010s, the, you know, the, the rise of Amazon, everything. So it's, it's all high highs and low lows and uh, everything in between and uh, again I I framed it all um, on four families there's a Duwamish family a Scandinavian family a Japanese family and a uh, black family all in this fictional neighborhood and it just wow. charts their interrelated lives over essentially three or four generations so wow you really went for it I yeah I, great. I, I, I no, I it's kind of very ambitious. I was telling Thomas, it's a very ambitious storyline, and you pull it off great. And not, and that's Thank a you. testament to your writing, I think, because that's a hard thing to do, to try to, like, sew these different decades and characters together. Uh, and so far, you're, like, what I've read so far, you're completely pulling it off really brilliantly. Thank so you. Are readers yeah. going to have a hard time telling fact from fiction? Yeah. I mean, it, it's... I, I so so well, wait, that's a good question, but yeah. What, what, did, no, what his question was my question. So, so I have you guys seen the Royal Tenenbaums? Of course. Yeah. Yes. So so yeah. I wanted to list. I wanted to keep historical fact at a little bit of an arm's length. I didn't want people to be like, but that was August in seventy one. How did that happen? And yeah. Yeah. you know, you yeah, said it was winter. That like, never happened. Well, those people yeah. are going to come out. Brad. Well, they're going to come out regardless. <laughs> I, 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 he, he knows the story. On my book, Lake City, I had somebody like shitting on me on a historical detail, and they're like, "You didn't even go to Nathan Hale. You went to Roosevelt." And I, was just like, <laughs> I was like, "Sorry, I, you know, I don't know, but um, you can never win." Yeah. No, um, that's my, a shout my, out for the podcast and uh, yeah. Thomas Constantine. Getting a little crazy up here in the zoo. Yeah. But um, so essentially, I 
was trying to write the great Seattle novel, but the book never once says the word Seattle in it. So I, I how's that possible? To, I, I what's did the name of the fake dancing. neighborhood? Mm. Stevenson. Well, there, there, there's a reason for that. Um, there's. Uh, well, I have I have a synopsis. You want me to read the synopsis here of the book? I, yeah, oh, please. Let me, let me try this. I, it's it's never been read out loud. It could be a little oh, dense and boring. This is okay. Boring. We can edit it out if it's um, twenty-seven uh, pages of the synopsis. Well, let me let me paraphrase. But essentially, it starts off the the head of the PTA at the school. She's trying to change the name of the school in the neighborhood for. The school is named after Stevens was the first territorial governor of Washington who was also involved with quite a bit of genocide and martial law and jailing his political opponents and all sorts of uh, rather unsavory things. So He's getting canceled. Yeah, he's getting getting canceled. canceled. So instead of Stevens, it became Stevenson. And there's a lot of, (laughs) you know, there's a a tech company that's both Microsoft and uh, Amazon called Mothership. There's... um, Boeing is uh, America's preeminent aerospace company. Like we have, you know, there are some obvious things in there, all just behind a thin veil of fiction, which gave me more freedom to tell the story that I wanted to tell and not be hamstrung by dates, etc. But but I think my goal in the end was not to tell a, a a specific historical tale. It was to get at the spirit of the place. So, so I really wanted to get at the the cultural soul of Seattle through the interactions of different people, through historical events, through the successes and failures uh, and challenges of different people. And so hopefully for those of us who live here and who grew up here, um, that will resonate. And I'm also hoping that by not making it like a straight like so specific so specific that people beyond Seattle will yeah, yeah. also that's just be like this is like the rise of an American city that that I want Seattle to not be just like uh, uh, specified as this is only for people from Seattle and you know it's got a bunch of like Ivar's references or whatever <laughs> like yeah um, the fish store like Ivar's city come cool, on Bob like, don't get me wrong but I, 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 you know, it's like, fuck, you read any book about New York, they're like, I don't know, like, Ragtime by E.L. Doctor. they're like, this is yeah. like a great book of American history. It's a total New York book. Like, yeah. it's all about New York. Why does New York, have the, like, America's happening here, too. I wanted, I wanted to write a, a Seattle book that was at once a Seattle book, but also about the rise of an American city, about something... Uh, uh, about the country to through through our lens. So that yeah. is my that is my great hope, and we'll see. Uh, Brad can tell you when he when he wades through the second half. Yeah, uh, but, uh, I'm looking well, forward yeah. to it. How long do the rest of us have to wait? What's the release date? So it was supposed yet? to it was supposed to come out this fall, but we have a rather if you haven't heard a rather uh, contentious presidential election coming up. And uh, I didn't want to be like, hey, buy my book, you know, in November yeah, 2024 oh when people are like buying, you know, rations and, <laughs> you know, hiking, hiking the, toward uh, Canada or whatever. So um, <laughs> it's coming out the end of February 25. It's a ways off. So the book is done, but the, the release has been postponed. So... Well, we're still okay. waiting on Brad's final edits. There's a couple of typos and some grammatical yeah. errors amazing. that we need My to clean up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, yeah. yeah. yeah, this country is so New York specific when it comes to its sort of literary history and all those For authors. Sure. But For when sure. you think about what we keep saying on this podcast, everything comes from Seattle. Like, yeah. you like good coffee? Seattle. Yeah. You have a computer at your work? Seattle. You order stuff online? Seattle. Everything. Uh, uh, commercial consumer air travel do you ever take planes boeing thank you very much like yeah. everything about your modern life comes from seattle and and now we know that and seattle invented allegory you know what i'm yeah. saying yeah. yeah did invent allegory yeah. too yeah. i no I, I i agree with you i actually um you know i know people have different opinions about anthony bourdain but his his one of his episodes in seattle he framed it up about that you know and and i'm, I'm super paraphrasing here but 
the, Seattle didn't necessarily invent a, a number of these different things, but it's the place that decided to perfect all of them. It's like, you know, we didn't there we, we didn't bring coffee to the United States. We're like, we're going to mainstream this and make it. We didn't invent computers here, but we made sure that everybody had one on their desk. We didn't, in, you we know, didn't invent like, microbrews, but guess what? And yeah, we, we invented for the microbrew. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's but, right. But, but I think and I think some of that and one thing I, I, I kind of talk about in the book is just being being kind of on the edge of the continent and not being not having our hands tied um, with history in the same way allows people here to think in a different way and to just try to like, okay, why don't we try it that way and not be like, yeah. well, my aunt and grandma and everybody else says that like, I, I, I don't know. My, my, my wife's Brazilian. She's from Rio de Janeiro. It's a super fun place. It's amazing. But and, and, and my only like minor criticism about the place would be is that in a, in a more homogeneous culture with a more clear sense of its history like that, it's like, well, this is the kind of music we like. This is the kind of food we like. Right, right. This is what we do. You know, this is what we do on this holiday. There's there's a clear sense. And that, that must be beautiful in many ways to have a clear sense of, like, your cultural container. Yeah. But here we don't really have that. Like, most mm. people aren't That's from here or yeah. if they are from here... Um, our friend Shelly over here is... I'm know, from Nevada. He's from Seattle. New Mexico. He's yeah. from Tacoma. Yeah. I met somebody today who's three generations... West Seattle. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Where are your folks born? Uh, Midwest. Midwest. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I was born I was born in Seattle, but my, my dad's from Chicago. My mom's from New York. So, you know, they moved out here for a fresh start. My, my dad was from, like, a pretty much all-Jewish neighborhood in... In Chicago, and my, and my mom was from a very not Jewish neighborhood in Long Island, and neither of them were particularly religious, and their families got along. It wasn't that, but it was like, let's move to a place where it's a fresh start, blank slate, and that's why they end up in Seattle because of, you know, and and so I think that 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 does play into people just thinking in different ways here, and you can. We're all immigrants can, in a sense. We are, and 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 and, sure. and uh, I think about lifestyle in different ways too, or think about coffee in a different way, or think about a computer in a different way, or whatever whatever it is. Um, and and obviously, as we become a bigger, more expensive city, that's ossifying a little bit. We're not maybe the, the same that we were in the seventies, eighties, and nineties. Underdog. Anymore. Yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah, I mean, you're not you're not buying a house here just coming <laughs> as a as a young person anymore. And, and yeah. you know, oh, you know, we're gonna get a house with a bunch of friends and rent. It's it's tricky. Um, it's hard, but. That's the process, you know. Uh, so how many dive bars do you talk about in Supersonic? Ooh, um, not as many as I did in my last book, uh, Lake City, um, which had a lot of rim rock in it. Okay. Uh, right. Rim rock was actually one of the main locations in it. And I, rim I, rock? I did, yeah, Lake City. Um, and I have a painting of the rim rock in my living room that, uh, that I commissioned from my friend who really killed it. It's, uh, it makes me happy every time I see it. Um, Let's see Ooh, bars, up. bars in supersonic bars. Not that I've read so far that I can remember any dive bars. Yeah. Second, second half of the book, Brad. Second well, half. Like second half of the book. It's not. He's not giving specific Seattle landmarks or yeah. names. Backdoor pub, stuff. fish store. You're making up the names land. of the dive bars. That's fine. Yeah, we'll, well, we'll, we'll allow that. We'll allow it. Well, anyway, so it's coming out next year. It doesn't come out until February, but I'll start. February prob- 2025? Probably starting. This is the first time that I... Uh, thank you, guys. First off, thank you so much for having me on. I've really enjoyed your your podcast and and absolutely you know learning so much more about a bunch of uh, places that i love and some places that i've driven by and been like i should fucking go there sometime and <laughs> have shanty tavern. i haven't and been to the shanty uh, shanty's yeah. shanty's great oh yeah, my it's gosh open fridays it's, yeah. actually shanty is not that shanty we've been to the shanty we've yes we have shanty. multiple yeah. times yeah yeah, yeah. so it might have just come out shanty yeah. for everybody out there is not that shanty in the end it's kind of they have like sometimes a relatively stiff cover charge and you get inside they got good bands it's like it's like a pretty civilized place in the in the end you know there are grittier yeah. places you, out there. you drop our name they'll let you in for free yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Pretty sure. keep there bringing we go. up even the diviest of dives in seattle has some amazing beers that are 
you know, some of the best This in is the, the Pacific Northwest after yeah, all. Yeah. It's good. We invented yeah. micros. Even the dives are shishi. It's, I, I, in it's the best way. Damn I'm, I'm with you. I don't want to use and, shishi, and got some killer music. I mean, a lot of the dives got killer music. Did you guys do the double J yet? No, we haven't done the double J. Double J, no, double the J. List. Double J's got a wall of mustaches in the back, and it's just <laughs> photos of like Tom Selleck and like everybody, everybody you've ever seen with a significant nice. mustache. Is it there. sounds like our kind of place. Yeah, yeah nice. it's, it's a good one, you know. But anyways, this is the this is the first opportunity I've had to really more publicly talk about the book. But starting in around July, when the advanced copies come out, I'm gonna start harassing and pleading and doing everything I can to uh, get the word out. So I appreciate you giving me the chance to exclusive to first talk about it. Here. Yeah, this is an exclusive. We'll definitely give you uh, another shout out when that date comes in July when you want to get the word out. We'll be happy to pass that. the word. And if you're listening to this episode in February 2025, go to the bookstore, look for... Yeah. We can make Run, it. don't walk. Go get it. Yeah, make, some, make something happen on the... Uh, we could do something in a dive bar down the line. Do you already have uh, some author events planned ahead? Uh, not planned. I, 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 I will... Um, I have a, a good relationship with some of the people over at um, Third Place Books, some friends of mine over there, and so I'll, I'll, I'll have the yeah. initial one there, and um, I'll also have one at, at Finney Books, um, and probably Elliott Bay. Elliot well, Bay. Hey, who knows? Yep. Who knows? Maybe, yeah. maybe we'll do some of the Double J. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> you guys could do a book release party at the Shanty also. We've yeah. done book release parties at dive bars. Yeah. Big right. hit, big crowds. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's you do, do it. it at the zoo. Let's do it. I they did, might uh, even turn down the the, the jig box for you. <laughs> I did a thing mm, with. No, uh, probably not. <laughs> my last book, uh, Deborah Juarez had like a re-election campaign thing, and because because the book was Lake City, she she was like, "Would you be our keynote speaker?" I was <laughs> like, "What the hell?" Did you actually read the book? <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> no. It was it was a weird it was a weird night. So She's you're. Like, Political consulting now. Yeah, basically. Okay. All I mean, right. Political consulting without getting paid for it. But I, I yeah. met some characters that. Pro photo political yeah. cons- consulting is that even a thing? I don't think so. It was a. Uh, it was an interesting evening. So. <laughs> <laughs> My friend, who's a. Uh, how would I say it? He too came up in a, a, Spaniard. In a punk band. No, he's not a Spaniard. A, just a, a punk band background. He, he was just sitting there shaking his head. He's like, you fucking sold out, man. What are you doing talking about? <laughs> I was like, I don't know. I'm just, it's at the shanty. I, um, Shilling uh, politicians. Yeah, yeah, uh-huh. He was just sitting just on the other babies. side of the bar shaking his whole head, his head the whole time. So uh, it is what it is. But. Sign in that uh, movie deal before the book's even out yet. Yeah, I wish. Yeah. Yeah, I'll take a movie deal. Anybody want to send me that? I'll sign it. Sight unseen. That's uh, it's hard out there as an artist nowadays. Netflix is making anything. Netflix is turning anything into a movie these days. So yeah, they'll hit you up. Well, awesome. Well, you want to knock it on the head? Yeah, I think we should land probably land this plane. We're gonna land. Let's this get a little plane. rowdy around here. We got the Olympics going Starting on. Get a little rowdy here. Shit. Well, Thomas, thanks again for joining us. Thank you all. Super glad that. You know, we, you got to discuss your book first here on our podcast. For sure. Uh, it's it was an honor. a true honor. And, uh, yeah, until next time, check us out on social media. Jeremy? Smash, like, subscribe, uh, click, and follow. There yeah. you go. Here we yes. go. That Please rate, fun. review, five stars. Any support for the show is five much appreciated. Stars, five stars and five bucks. That's all we ask. All right. <laughs> there you go. Well, until next time, cheers. Thanks, Thanks everybody. everybody.